Kyle Nelson and Chase Williams, um, the two senior VPs of Aptive Pest Control, the largest door-to-door, -door, am I fair to say that? The largest door-to-door -door pest control force out there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You guys did how many accounts this year? As a company, we did 185,000. 185,000 pest control accounts. That's like, I mean, are you guys like up there with the Ar uh, Orkins and the Terminexes yet? Like, I mean. So customer-wise? No. No. Uh, they're, they're like the ADTs of, like, yeah, yeah, they're, they're like the ADTs of, yeah. Of, yeah. I mean, they, but like for door to door, that's like, oh, yeah. for unreal. door to door, it's unreal. unreal. Yeah. Um, so basically, um, let's dive into this. So tell us a little bit about, this is the first time I've had two people on the same uh -huh. podcast. So let's start with you, Chase. Tell me about your story, kind of how you got into it. Yeah. So I, I got into it in 2007. Bess Pearson, who is the CEO of Active, uh, recruited me to come out and sell on his That's team. That's a terrible person. Oh my goodness. <laughs> he was a stud. He, uh, yeah, taught me how to sell pest control, went out and sold 452 my first summer. Um, Company record, that was, right? That, that was, was, like, that was big top deal. first year. Big deal. Lasted for about six years. Now it's been destroyed multiple times. This year alone, five guys sold over 500 his first year. Their first, holy cow. So, I mean, it's crazy how we just, it's like the four minute mile. It's like, it just keeps just getting broken, yeah. broken. It's, it's yeah. wild. It's awesome. Um, so tell me, tell me a little bit about you, Kyle. Like, how'd you, you, you kind of have a different story. Yeah. And this is inspiring. In my opinion, it's like, because I was always like, oh, the tech's like, whatever. There's just guys mm -hmm. that can't sell. But like, you have a cool Yeah, story. so I, uh, I guess I'm like the, the Drake of pest control. I started from the bottom now. Um, no, I, I started off as a tech, actually the same year that Chase started selling. So in 2007, I was out uh, spraying houses, killing bugs, and then uh, was a service manager, kind of over the technicians, serviced his first you account. You yeah, my first account, my second, second yeah. year. First door I knocked, yeah. sold, you serviced it right out. Yep, and he, had like, awesome. yeah, and he had like three sales waiting, like already by the time I got that one done. Like he was just a beast, so. Uh, and then the next year, I was a branch manager, so I was actually running the, uh, the operations. With pest control, there's a branch that's year-round operation, technicians, office staff, like it's, it's a functioning like brick-and-mortar location. Yeah. And so after doing sales rep payroll throughout the summer, I was realizing that... Uh, Dude, I get, I, was, I get scared that the payroll people, like, I feel bad sometimes, I'm like... I don't want you to see my checks. Just yeah. it's like you're yeah. making how much amount? And so, <laughs> and so I was like, man, brings them over to the yeah, So there's 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 guys <laughs> that are making more in a summer than I was making as the branch manager in the, you know in a, in a year. And I was living in the Bay Area, and so my cost of living, like, I was making good money, and so I decided to switch sides. You, I, and, let me let me ask you this: Did you ever have the question of like, but I'm just not a sales guy? Like, I mean, because that's how a lot of people are. They're like. Oh, I'm. That's not me. Like, I'm not a sales guy. That yeah. guy. That guy's a sales guy. But he. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, summer summer sales or door to door has kind of like that. Yeah. Had that had that stigma, stigma. and and it wasn't really until I saw the chases and the vests of the industry and was out there servicing their accounts that I was like, maybe I could do this. Like, I, I didn't. He's kind of quirky and weird. You know? Yeah. And yeah and so yeah. so it really it really <laughs> it was it really was uh, it was really seeing seeing the these guys sell and how they sold. That gave me like confidence that I could that I could do it, you know, maybe. And then I yeah. went out and end of the first year sold two sixty in Phoenix in two thousand ten and then recruited a team and So and you don't have to be calling. a four hundred and seventy account rep the first year in order to become mm -hmm. senior VP. Nope. Is what we're learning. Yeah, yeah just <laughs> just work hard. Cool. So you kinda you know, you had obviously a slower like first year, then you went and managed I'm mm -hmm. assuming, and then yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. double, I, not double, but did 100 accounts more my second year from my first year to 360 my second year, and you know, that recruiting grew, and then that recruiting grew, and then that recruiting grew, and, and uh, just now I'm, now I'm here. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Yeah, exactly. Love it. <laughs> um, so this year you guys did, you did 70,000 in your group, you did... About 40, 50, so 50. 48, 48, 49,000 right now. Still has a couple guys out there. Still have a few guys out there in the postseason. How many pest control companies could say they have done that many? Just 70,000. I mean, I don't think you alone would yeah, be bigger than... I don't think there's any pest control company that's ever done 70,000 in the summer. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Just your group alone yeah. beats out 99% of pest control companies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yours alone. Yeah. That's crazy. So... I'm I'm just excited for you guys just to jam like this will this will be this will be fun. So, um, 
tell me a little bit about we're gonna we're gonna talk on three topics okay leadership obviously you've done something phenomenal to grow you know hundreds of thousands of accounts over the years culture and just like the integrity and like what's created like the leaders and companies that you've that you guys are a part of um, so let's jam on like leadership first obviously you had to do something right for your people to stay loyal for you long enough in order to like, be here so yeah, tell me a little bit about what makes you good. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think it started from my leader, the things that I learned from him. Uh, Bass, you know, set a really good vision of what I could do and, and his example of good leadership. Uh, for me, leadership is is a key part of keeping guys bound to you and helping them. Um, so for me, it's recognizing their potential as a leader, recognizing the potential of guys under you, and then setting the vision to help them that potential uh, and then for me I think there's a lot of different type of leadership styles for me it's my style is just servant leadership I'll do anything for any of my guys to help them reach their goals that they have and just having them see that you're like fully there to always serve there. Yeah, always there to do whatever they need you know, at their beck and call some of my managers call me their, their secretary and I'm fine with that well, it's the uh, attitude of, yeah. I'm not your boss. You're my boss. I work for you. Work for like, you. Yeah. I know I'm over you, but it's the attitude of, you're my boss. Yeah. You tell me where you need me, and I'm there. Yeah. That's cool. Exactly. What, about, what about for you? What, what things have stood out for you? Yeah, I think it's the, very similar to Chase. I think um, my, my reps, are, you know, my, my team, my, my family, you know, um, they, I'll never ask something from them that they, that they know that I wouldn't be willing to go out and do myself or that I haven't already done myself. And so knowing that, that I'm there for them, but that I'm also leading by example, like being an example is super important to me. Even now, I'll still go out and knock uh, and still sell when I can in my free time. And, and people are like, well, you're a VP of sales. Why aren't you you know, taking some time off during the you know, summer and kind of relaxing a little bit? Like, I don't know how to relax. I don't know how to like stop like grinding. But for me, it's also just showing those guys, even the, the newer people, the first years that are in that I, that I can still go out and, and throw on, you know, five, six, seven, eight, ten accounts, you know, a day that I can be, be current. And so I think the example, the example is really, huge. really huge. Um, actually, I mean, you have a really cool story about example. Like, tell <laughs> them about that. What was it? Seattle. Seattle. Yeah, tell them about Seattle. Yeah, this, this story gets thrown around after the month. Yeah, I want to hear it. I'm excited. <laughs> um, so this was my second year managing a team. We went up to, to Seattle. We opened up a branch. We'd only sold in California. So rain was something brand new to us. Does rain bring more bugs or less bugs? Or? It, it, it pushes bugs inside. Okay. It does. It's, especially up in Seattle, tons of snails and slugs. But it was the knocking. It was the knocking in the rain. Yeah. Oh, you have to deal California. with California. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. No sunshine down in Southern California. Perfect weather. It's not even like hot. Yeah. 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 So we go up to Seattle, and this day, it was like maybe the third week of the summer. We go into this area. It's Everett. I, I remember every part of this it's funny because i get a text from my brother and he's like hey pretty much the whole team's going home because it's raining we don't like the area and i always you know like area's never a factor in sales it's always your mindset and they're getting defeated by the rain because it's just raining all day and so i was sucking up i had like one cell by lunch. Actually, I think I had one cell like six when I got that text, I got a cell. And then I get that, see my phone, I have that text from my brother saying everyone's going home. And They're I'm all like, like playing mutiny. Yeah. We're not knocking in the rain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a manager, the that's the worst. You're just like, yeah. suck it up, little pansies. Like, let's go. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the worst text. Oh, you're just I, like, got, I, I can't even express that anger that I felt at that moment. That, my goodness, my team is falling apart. It's the third week of the summer. Yeah, they can't handle they the rain. They can't handle it's the rain. Seattle, we're going to deal with that. We're going to deal with this all summer, yeah. yeah. And so I uh, I had a, a girl I was training. She's shadowing me, you know, seeing how the cell was done. It was her first day. I'm like, okay, i gotta, I got to kill it in the last two hours. It was 7 o'clock. I had one. It was a, so by, by 7, I still didn't have any cells, so I was getting really frustrated. Everyone went home. I was like, okay, I just got to reset my mindset. Finally got a cell. Boosted my confidence a little. And the next seven doors, I sold. So I ended up with, I think it was, it was eight sales that day. That girl's like, oh, pest control's so easy to sell. I'm so excited. Because <laughs> she just like, saw me sell seven doors in a row. <laughs> and so. In the rain. In the rain. 
And so I go home, I go, I go back that night, don't even tell anyone what I sold. Because it was back then we didn't have yeah, before all the there things. There was no cool dashboards. Yeah, yeah. There was like, nothing like yeah. that. You can, and so I was like, I'm not telling anyone what I sold until the morning meeting. And I'm just going to be like, look, you guys missed out. Man, the bugs got pushed in the home from the rain. It, went, it was awesome. The afternoon was money. Everyone was home. I sold seven, sold seven doors in a row. Like, it just all falls, falls down. The more you knock, it's a numbers game. Sometimes they come in the morning, sometimes they call come in the evening. Most of the time they're spread out throughout the day. You just have to stay consistent. Um, that year I ended up having seven guys sell over 300. So. Wow. And I'm sure they were a lot of those accounts sold in the rain. Right? Yep. <laughs> well, no one ever left home. That's or left for home. So it, was, it totally shifted the culture of we knock in the rain. Like yeah. our identity is like rain or shine, let's go. Let's go at it. Because that's like one of the hardest things. If you, I, I'm sure your managers and you guys have dealt with kind of, I call them like mini mutinies in the summers. All the yeah. time. Um, it's like this little clan is like, we don't like the manager. And then they sp- spread that cancer and you're just like, they're revolting. You call your manager, your regional or whatever. And it's like, how my reps are going to leave this week? Like, what do I do? Like, what do you do in those situations like what are some other things? So that's like a perfect story. And that's yeah. actually like really cool. But like, what are this is kind of this is a good jam? Let's run on this thread. So, um, what do you do in those situations? You're the manager. You're like, how do I turn these guys around? What do you do? But I, I I think our my my first response is are you are you working? Are you putting in time? You know, so they can look to you as a manager and say, you know, if I'm doing what he's doing, am I seeing success? So the manager's working less hours than it should be or half days or cutting out early, leaving like prime time, like that his team's gonna follow and although he still might be putting up good sales numbers because he's a he's a talented rep or he's this second or third or fourth year and he has it down. The first year reps need that full day. They need that full day example to, to see success and because if they see that they see the veteran only working four hours, they're, like, they're yeah. like, I can work four hours. And they go out and get zero. And yeah. if they're if they're not making sales they're not making money if they're not seeing success. Like, I don't know if this is all right to say on your, your you podcast, but, you but I, I, I call it like, I call it fat bastard syndrome. Good. I you know, love from, this word. From, uh, from, from Austin Powers. Okay. You know, so, <laughs> so, 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 like, so yeah, so at the so like, if a sales rep is unhappy, it's like, I eat because I'm unhappy and I'm, un, I'm unhappy because I eat. You know, he's like, I eat because I'm unhappy and I'm unhappy because I eat. So like, if a sales rep's not happy, they're not gonna sell. And if they're not selling, they're not gonna be happy. And so, like, if somebody's kind of in that in that rut or that, if the team's unhappy, it's usually because they're not seeing success. And so, like, I say, you say, stop being fat bastard from Austin Powers, you know? And they're like, what do you mean? And like, I explain that. Like, if you're happy, you're going to sell. If you sell, you're going to be happy. It's just like, flip it and, and let that become, you know, part of it. And it's like, well, what do you need to be happy? Do we need to take a day off and go to Magic Mountain? Do we need like do some big activity? No, just. Go out there and work. Like, see the success of your labors, and and usually, if the manager starts, you know, from the top, putting back in the with the right hours, the right amount of time, the right amount of effort, and the guys that follow will will typically, you know, follow suit. So how do you? Yeah, that that brings me kind of to the next question. How do you have that coaching conversation with that rep to get them out of a slump? They're like, dude, I go out there, I'm working really hard, and in their yeah. mind, right, I'm out there hustling, and I just I'm just not seeing results, yeah. man, and you know, I'm doing all the right things, and you're just like, how do you get through yeah. to that guy? I, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's part of it, it's just transparency. Like, the nice thing about our, our, our software, and there's a lot, of, a lot of software out there that'll do, you know, stuff similar, like I think Sales Rabbit, and um, there's like other like outcome knocking, like tracking stuff, but we can, we can see how many doors a day that, you know, our teams are knocking, they can see how many doors a day they're knocking as a rep, how many people they're talking to, and how other people are talking to, what the outcomes are, not home, not interested in contract with another company, product concern, price concern, renter, no English speaker, like they can see all of their outcomes. And so for us, it's just, it's really easy to call a rep that's saying, I'm doing everything I can and say, well, actually you're not. Here are the things you're Because like. the rep on your team that's selling five a day is knocking this many doors, talking to this many people, and he's closing these, the, you know, these things. And then the ones that he's not closing, he can work on and train. And so. So I can usually look at a guy's knocking dashboard and say, I need to train you on the switchover, the takeover account. I need to train you on the non-interested because those are your, your top two, like your highest like, uh, 
dispositions. Dispositions or, or rejections or whatever, yeah. you know, the reason you're not closing, these are what customers are telling you, like not interested and, and they're with somebody. So let's work on those. Um, also, let's work a little bit more or knock more doors or walk a little faster or get a Segway or a scooter. Uh, Razor scooter. Yes. Razor scooter. Um, when are you coming out with your, your own brand? Are you I, dude, the one day. That, that, that the D2D scooter. We'll put yeah, like a little right. path for your iPad. Like, <laughs> come. But I mean, fine. so it's either work, work harder, so knock more doors, so talk to more people or train or do both. And, and I think really like what I try to push is, is do, do both. So train in when you're not knocking. And then you know, find ways to always knock more, whether it's taking shorter lunches, getting on the doors earlier, working later. I mean, my latest sale has been 11:45 at night, and, and in pest control, that's that's, like, that's unheard of. Um, and uh, and so I know that late sales can happen, and it's all about mindset. Like, I'm not going to go home without a without without at least one sale. I've bageled one day. I've had a zero day once in my entire. I'm knocking. It was because you weren't wearing a hat, right? Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But going on top of that, I think it's nice to be able to target those things and find out what their issues are, but then it's the mindset you have to change too with that rep. Um, so sitting down with them and helping them re refocus on what their goals were coming before out before they came out. Yeah. There's and a reason why they came out. Yeah. Three weeks in, they forget that. Because yeah. you can point out all the things they're doing wrong and help them do it, but if they don't get in the right mindset again, yeah, because they, they, they might be like, I know I need to work harder. Mm -hmm. I know I need to do this, but if I work harder, I'm still going to get the same so, results. Yeah, I, yeah. Like they kind of have this victim play. Yeah, exactly. So, like, what are so some you questions to, or things? So, th do? things you have to do to switch that is first help them realize they have this negative mindset. That can be a hard thing for some sales reps to take in because right now they're blending everything else, wherein it's actually them. They're ca they're causing this cancer to grow inside them. And so you do have to help them recognize that themselves that, yeah, okay, there are things that maybe I can do better as a leader for you. And sort of take responsibility in like, okay, I need to do this for you here. I'll come out and go knock doors with you. Let's get you out of this mindset. Let's have you have fun on the doors. Let's help you start enjoying this again. And then also, I think, I think the key thing is helping them recognize that there is something they need to fix in their mind. And I, I think going on, along with that is when they see you get vulnerable and like take ownership over like them, a lot of times if you're just, if you're cranking out a ton of deals and you're hustling three times as hard as everybody else and you're leading from the front, that rep is going to go, wait, no, no, you're, it's not your fault. And then they yeah. go, well, it's really my, and then yeah, you're like, so, oh, yeah. wait, what? Like, yeah. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then you're like, oh, you're starting to recognize exactly. it. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. As you take some part of the blame from them, they're yeah. more willing to voice, okay, there is issues I have. Yeah. And then once they recognize that, okay, let's fix these things. Here are things that we can do to help you get rolling. Cool. Um, and one thing I love to fix the negativity, because that's typically what happens at yeah. that point, is I just have guys write down lists of why they're grateful. If you ever feel like that neg negativity is creeping in, write down what you're grateful for. Yeah, it's one of the fastest shifts. Actually, today I'm releasing the podcast of Mr. Thank You. Yeah. And yeah. it is amazing the study and the, the stories that have come from gratitude and just exactly. how it shifts your mindset. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, a lot of times it's just because we're so prideful and just humbling down and being like, I guess I do have a great job and I grab a great family and I have a great opportunity. Yeah. Just, it's a quick way. And I think, too, um, sorry to catch you. No, you're good. Because I, I mean, I, with that, with, you know, servant leadership or servitude, you know, based leadership, is taking an interest in your people, like looking for, for trends and looking, trying to get ahead of the negativity or ahead of that, that mini mutiny on the team or, or that rep, like being involved, like looking at the guys that sold well, calling them, texting them, hey, great job, but also looking at the guys that, that didn't sell well or haven't been selling well or that were, were on fire and now they're, now they're, you know, they're, they're having an off week or two. Um, like reaching out to those guys almost before, before they get to that breaking point. Yeah. The whole like, People don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. Like, if they know that they matter to me more than the override or the the commission or the, the money, then they're going to respond more to my my coaching. And if they just think that I'm, you know, looking for the, as many recruits as I can, anybody anybody in Provo with a pulse can come sell pest control. You know, like if they just feel like a number, then they're they're going to respond as a number. But if I know them. And I know about them. I know their name. I know, you know I'm friends with them on Facebook. Yeah. I, I there's a relationship there. They respond better 
to to coaching. And so I've always tried to tried to make it a point to put money, you know, fourth or fifth down the list of reasons why I do this job, and and keep it there. Yeah. Because the second that somebody's focus becomes like not as a first year rep, like first year reps, they're there to make money and like they can throw those blinders on. That's great. Like I call it like the, the selfish summer where that's what they should be focusing on. Like, this is me, and it's that one year where they they can really just focus on nobody but themselves. You know, second year, you get into leadership, you get into to, to training and recruiting. Like, I mean, we're all parents, you know? And I, I look at, um, we do things differently now because we're parents, and we did when we were single. Yeah. And, and so I, I, we make decisions of what's best for my kids, what's best for my family. And when I'm a recruiter, when I'm a recruiter and I'm in a recruiting situation, I try to, to look at them as, my, as my, my kids in a weird way, where I'm like, is, is this decision gonna be best for them? And best for for my my family, like, yeah. And, I, and you know, so that's kind of how I look at it, and they it, it seems to have worked. No, it's 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 showing that appreciation and, and, and curiosity, and it's hard for them to receive anything when they don't feel like you care. Yeah. You can tell them all the best lines and the best things, yeah. and they're like, "But I don't I don't give a crap. Screw you." Like you yeah. know what I mean? And so one of the questions, and this may be a weird question, but it's something I deal with in that regards is let's say I have 30 guys on my team. Mm -hmm. How, like what systems and could you put in place to constantly keep that proactive communication with each individual rep? Like when you're managing a bigger team and, or even, even yeah, 15 people, like how do you not avoid forgetting about this dude and yeah. forgetting about this dude? Do you have like some... So with Aptive, we actually have rules in place. And it's part of our success, but we don't allow teams bigger than 15 oh, really? to not have multiple high-level reps on that team. So 250 level is, a, is what qualifies guys to be a team leader with us. So if we're having more than 15 guys, we have multiple 250 level reps. Even with 15 guys and less, we try to get multiple 250 level reps on that team. Um, and give responsibilities to those reps to kind of empowering have, others to yeah, like, it's like preparing them to be leaders as well and yeah. giving them responsibility because that is a huge problem yeah because it, it's, it's like it's almost like well you don't care you don't reach out it's like dude you've got to realize like, like 30, 30 people, people. Yeah. Like, yeah. and that's that's one of the things that has made active so successful is we make sure because they're ha i'm not going to say we're perfect because we learn that from yeah making mistakes where we have lost people because we try to run a team of 20 or 23 by with one leader it's hard. It's, hard. It's, it's really hard. So we really try to get multiple people on the team to make sure that we don't have reps that are getting lost in there. And, and that kind of leads me to the next topic of culture because that piece, having come, some strong reps on the squad, because everybody's like, I'm going to run a team. I'm going to recruit 10 guys. I'm okay. a brand new guy. I'm going to be a manager. But sometimes it's okay to humble down and be like, I'll be an assistant or I'll just be a, a sales rabbit, like a like a leader on the team, not even yeah. with the title. And that creates culture in my mind. So like yes. you got, I mean, that's like obviously one thing that you guys preach all the time. Um, so let's jam on culture a little bit. So like, what have you found in your leadership as you guys have built teams and grown teams and divisions or whatever you call this, but like, um, what do you do to create this culture in an office that just dominates? Because, I mean, to have what you guys have done, I mean, it's phenomenal. Yeah, a culture is a huge part of it, for sure. And, and it, all, it came from, culture comes from the top. Yeah. It came from Dave, it came from Vass, and the way that they created how they did things sort of is what developed me into my culture and how I do things. Um, there's a lot of different aspects of culture that we could dive into, but I think a big part of it is, is um, for me, it's getting my guys coming out and when I'm recruiting them and helping them see what they want to do is, for me, the culture is, you're going to earn good money doing this job. Door-to-door -door sales, you will earn good money. It's a hard thing to do, but it's also the most rewarding. Hardest things are always the most rewarding. And then as you earn that money, don't just go spend it. So often in in this industry, that's what guys want to do. They want to go buy this car, the BMW, that they earn 35000 but they're spending all their money in the car. You know? I had a rep deal here. <laughs> yeah. And then he, three weeks later, asked me for a loan. I'm yeah. Like, oh. 
That was smart. I, I mean, a lot of companies like their guys to do that because it keeps them coming back year after year. After we, like I said, it comes from Dave Vance. You earn the money, make that money work for you. Be smart with that money, do those things. And so it creates, it's created a culture here where we're working to make, get to a point where we don't have to work anymore. Yeah. Where it's a passive income that we're making. And, and, I, and I love that aspect that Dave and Vance have always transferred down to us. They're always encouraging us to invest our money, do these things with our money, do this type of stuff. Because it creates a, yeah, I'm going to work hard for these aspects. Yeah. Rather than just work hard for this sort of instant gratification. Yeah. You know, I mean, car, you're going to have a while, but then you're going to be out and slave again. Exactly. So, so that kind of brings me, like, to your journey a little bit. Because you started in 07, and then it wasn't until 2012 that it sounded like you really were like, oh, I'm going to do this. Even 2011, you were saying, oh, you didn't even sell 2011. I didn't sell 2011. I got my pilot's license. Went and yeah. flown and got a pilot's license. Because... That's a real like, job. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to be a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, honestly, what I was thinking is like, I'll become a pilot, and then Dave's going to want to get a, a private jet, and I'll fly Dave everywhere. Yeah. That's a good thing. So, that was, no, but I, uh, every year, I was like, this is my last year, so. 2008, ran a team, last year, so. Kept coming back because I'd invest my money and realize, man, I can get to a point where I don't ever have to work. Yeah. And I had this passive income coming in, and then I got to, yeah, 2012, and invest built this vision. He's like, hey, Chase, we're starting a company called Altera. We just sold Eco First. And at that time, with Eco First, it's like, hey, you can be a team leader. That's all you are. You know? Then we start, started Altera, and it's like, hey, here's our vision. Here's our goals. Here's the tiers that you can grow up and grow into. Here's the goals of the company. This is my goal for you. I would love to help you hit these numbers and earn this amount of money and be able to help this many reps be successful. And I was like, you know that sounds fun to me. Helping other people have the same success that I have sounds something that I can enjoy and have a lot of fun doing. And so painting that picture for me is really what started off. I had about 60 guys in 2012, and now in 2017, put on 70,000 accounts. Yeah. So. so, and I think that there's something to be said with like, Vest having that sit down and saying, here's the vision, here's like, here's the long-term path, yeah. Because I'm sure you operated differently than the three or four years prior. Oh, way different. Like, if I'm a manager and I had the old Chase on my team, he wouldn't have really been, like, a big asset. Like, you sold a lot, which yeah, is sold cool. Well. But it was the attitude of, like, this is my last year, this is my last year, versus the attitude of getting your guys bought into this long-term play yeah. They operate on a whole different culture yeah. and, and level. I think. Yeah. And, and I saw what that vision did for me, and I was able to help transfer that vision to other guys. And what they wanted to hit. Yeah. And up until that point, like, you know, when I sold 2010, 2011, you know, 2012, it was, it was always like, okay, we have this many, you know, this much room for recruits. You know, Chase, go get your 30 guys or go, you know, go get this, fill your team and then and That's you're, it. you're good. Yeah. But uh, to go along with what Chase said about Vest painting the vision is, is Vest not only painted the vision and said, this is where the company's going to go. He, he backed it up with, with, with facts. He said, if you do what I've done, you know, from my, my Moxie years and Eco First years, recruiting this many to then this many to then this many, like he, he modeled our, like our path of growth to what he had already done. And said, this is, this is the schedule I worked, this is where I recruited, how I recruited, this is what I did. If you do what I've, what I've done, then this is where you can go. And so it wasn't just this vision of this is what we're gonna do, and like just throw a you know, dart at the board and hope we, we get there. He backed it up with with what he what he had done and said, "I've modeled our future off of where my journey with Dave has gone, and this is where where I want all of you guys to be able to go, and all of your guys can get, can get there, and you guys can get there." And if anyone comes to you and says, "Hey, how do I become a regional manager? How do I become a VP of sales or a division manager?" It's this is what I've done because I did this because this is what Vest did, yeah. and it's really just that the past is the best predictor of the future, and and I just did exactly what Vest did, you know, and maybe improved a little bit uh, along the way, and uh, with hours and recruiting and recruiting and things, and we've grown because of it. Yeah, and I think I think there's something to be said on, like, just the retention, like, you guys were, this is the only pest control people you've been at, mm -hmm. and um, I'm sure there were times of temptation to go somewhere else, or start your own, or get offers from this, and I think the ability to, one, just plant your feet, and stay there, 
through the thick and thin, mm -hmm. pays off. Yeah, the grass is the grass is green. It's where you water. Where you water, because yeah. I'm sure there were bigger and better pest control companies prior to Altera. There were the Moxies and the whatevers, right? And and then the other side of that is helping retain those reps because it's hard to create a culture when you're getting new dude, new dude, new dude. All the time. They can't help instill the new culture. Like, culture. It's like wait, we're having to rebuild our culture every yeah. year. So I think the ability for what Aptiv's done and what you guys have done is, I mean, you've worked with the same people for And I think years. a big part about getting those people coming back year after year is that transparency. Exactly. And helping set correct expectations for them. When they exceed those expectations, they're going to come back. Yeah, what's the biggest reason people quit? I'm sure you've had people leave oh, you. I mean, oh, that's just part of the business. And, I mean, we all make mistakes, right? I might yeah. have told a guy that I thought he could get here because I thought that was his potential, and then he doesn't work to where he could or do yeah. the things that are required for him to get there, and then he's mad at me because you told me I could do this. And I'm like, oh, I should have. Yeah. I should always under-promise. And so, yeah, you definitely always have to set the correct expectations or you do lose guys. Because any time they go out and they don't do what you set as an expectation, they're looking around. Um, but if you if you set it to where you're going to help them get to those goals and they get to those goals, they're going to trust you. They're going to come back year after year after year. And more than them, more than them even actively looking around, I think that that we've built such a, a culture of well-trained, hardworking sales forces that we almost anyone that says they work with Aptiv or with Altera Fire, like it has a target on their back, you know, like. Their people, companies go out of their way to like, you know, to, to headhunt our people, yeah. and so so you might find a rep that that did fall a bit short of his goal or didn't make quite what he wanted to make after he had a few cancels or a few customers not pay their bills on time, and you know they, they get headhunted by by someone else and a big bonus or you know the the, the, the look at this so I can distract you from from these yeah. like thing like you know so so a lot of times like. They're, they might have gone out and just bought their, you know, bought that BMW that cost fifty thousand dollars or you know or more, you know, when they only made thirty five, and now they're they're do I go get a job at McDonald's during the off season? Do I go get a bonus from the next biggest company that's throwing out a big offer? And so though, a lot of times it's not even that they they're leaving because they're disappointed in their experience. It's just because they're getting headed because of active training and talent and. Kind of what, we, what we've done. But you should almost feel honored. You know, yeah. like, we yeah. have the best guy. Yeah. You know, yeah. what I, mean? I love like, going head to head with you when you try to take some of my, some yeah, of my guys. No, and it's, 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 there's a pride. Like that's another thing and about culture. Is, how many of them did you get? None. I, 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 just, <laughs> I, I, hey, we've been in that battle. I love it, dude. I love it. Uh, but but what's crazy is it's the pride of I'm proud to be where I'm at, mm -hmm. and getting your people proud to be where they're at. And I think. You know, you might be some small little company working here. Not, every, not everybody can work at Active, right? So, well, they could, but um, but what I mean by that is, let's say I'm a 20-man company, and it's like, find what the best thing about our 20-man company is, and make everybody so proud of that thing that they're like, we're the best at this, and we do this that no one else does, and we do, you know, it's like, what's our competitive advantage is what my dad always taught yeah. us. It's like, yeah. We have a competitive edge, and I'm going to preach and instill and talk about and, and just make sure we hammer that yeah. into, into the guts. Yeah, I think you develop a set of core values that you stand for as a company, and you you don't deviate from that. You preach that from the, from the get-go, and that's 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 what you, you push. The fastest way to lose your reps is just not living in integrity yep, and, exactly. and, and being out of alignment with what those reps believe and like it's so funny I had a rep call me yesterday looking to get hired and he was like honestly like I just don't want to work with a culture because every company I've been at everybody smokes weed in my office everybody you know what I mean he's like I'm this yeah. mom and dad with four kids and I'm out here with these 21 year old like kids are going to strip clubs and smoking weed and I'm just like obviously your just inner being is like misaligned right now and I'm like you're calling for a culture of this where uh, of like honest and good and you know that value yeah. and it's like you, you'd be surprised like how how many times reps good reps leave just simply because they can't handle the integrity yeah, the culture. the culture the environment yeah. and, and that's another big part of Aptiv's culture is, is we won't take everyone with the breath you know that has a heartbeat and can breathe it, I mean we are looking for reps that represent our culture and we won't bring on people that we feel don't represent our culture 
and we do turn people away, which is surprising in the industry. A guy comes to us and says, I want to work, I want to do door to door. Yeah, I saw I want 300 to sell. accounts, but then there's people we turn away. We turn them away because we look at background checks, we look at things that. Some people t- just, oh, what? let's give them the best, you know. Yeah. yeah. And that's something important is like, even just down to the manager level, mm-hmm. it's okay to fire a dude. Like, mm-hmm. I think a lot of reps or managers get this fear of like, I need to hold on to these 20 people. I hold on to everyone I can. Everyone I can, because if I had 16, I'm not going to sell me. It's like, sometimes letting go of the three cancer yeah. dudes that just aren't a fit and aligned with your mm-hmm. values. It's going to help you sell more. Exactly. All your guys are sell more because of that. Exactly. Okay, so... Kind of shifting gears here. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about some of like the crazy things and either rep, like dude freaking stole my car and drove it off a cliff stories to <laughs> either craziness on the doors that you've seen or been part of or heard of, like that you guys have been through your whole careers. Well, you hit this one um, first guy. I don't know. I mean, I, I think uh, I, I've had a goal. Uh, it's just. One of, one of my weird little quirks with my summers is I have a goal of, of every year to either um, either sell a little person. I don't want to call them a midget because that's not respectful, but a little person or a celebrity. Um, either one. Um, and, and I have. I mean, every year I've, I've, uh, I've sold somebody you know, famous, whether it's been like an actor or musician, uh, professional sports player. That's awesome. And uh, it started when I sold MC, MC Hammer. Actually, you sold MC yeah, Hammer. Yeah, yeah. I sold MC Hammer. How do you knock on that door? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> you know, so so he was. So I lived in I lived in Tracy, California, and I, awesome. I was the branch manager actually at the time. And it was you know I'd already decided to, to to leave at the end of the summer and become a sales rep and and sell. And so I gave the sales reps his address. They were knocking my my city, and I of course I knew where he lived because the the LDS missionaries in my in my ward. At the time, we're like, yeah, this is his address. We like, we we, we want to teach him about 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 the gospel. We want to teach him about Jesus, and uh, so they, they they knew where he lived. And so I wrote the address on the on the board of the office and said, you guys have two weeks. Whoever wants to knock his door, go ahead. And if nobody's sold him or approached him in two weeks, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna who was that? I'm gonna go sell him. I'm gonna go sell him. And of course, all the reps that year were we didn't want to be the guy that got rejected by MC Hammer that tried to sell him and didn't. And so, like for two weeks, nobody like knocked. Nobody went and knocked that door. It's an interesting principle, though. And uh, and so, so I, I had so a, it's just waiting. Yeah, and so I had, I, had, I had said like, hey, like I'm gonna go knock the door now. Today's the day I'm gonna go sell MC Hammer. And so I go knock the door and or pull up to the house, and he's actually like in his driveway, kind of kind of like dancing, popping, locking with it, like the neighborhood kids and stuff, and just kind of just kind of hanging out with, with, with the neighborhood kids and his sons and stuff, and. So I, I, I approach him and I just go right into our, our, our pitch, like, hey, how's it going? Uh, eco first at the time, like, with eco first, we're taking care of, you know, so-and-so neighbors. It's a bunch of the spiders, uh, ants. If I can get you done, I'm doing it for, for cheap. And he immediately bites, what do you mean by cheap? You know, what's cheap? You know, and so so I sell him and uh, and uh, he, he just, he buys a lot of black widows, a lot of ants, a lot of spiders, you know, so we, we does it cost more to spray a house that big? Or? Um, I mean, yeah, you can was, charge. You charge. Was, and, he, and he lived in a nice house. Like people worry about has he rebounded and stuff. Like he lives, lives in a nice house. He lives comfortably. He like, has free banana trees. Like, like really, really like, cool, cool dude. Um, so I sold MC Hammer, and uh, and then the next year I was actually selling in Phoenix, and uh, he's coming through like on a tour with like an old like like girl R and B band from the '90s as well. Like he's just on a little tour and uh, so I, I you know reach out to them and say hey on my my sales team's here in Arizona I see you're coming on tour and we ended up with backstage passes like the next year there was concert we ended up on stage with with him and like his crew for can't touch this for his finale and we were up on stage and we had just got the knocking so we were in our like polo shirts that with our sales so logos sick. like trying our best to do the to, like do the hammer dance and everything and it was it was a fun fun experience and so every year That's since awesome. then that I've gone out and sold I've sold either a, a little person or a celebrity or both. That's so cool. Yeah, that's fun. Do you have any crazy story? I mean, I don't, uh, nothing like that. I know. I was like, <laughs> should we just end on <laughs> that? Like, I'm like, uh, crap. My, but, my stories really just deal with weird, like people, people. you run into. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot of us. I think either one time or another, if you're not so many years, you're going to have that opportunity to be. Great. Molest- yes, the molested <laughs> so, person. <laughs> um, 
I definitely had that opportunity. Um, one of my favorites that I laugh about all the time because I was out training um, and this guy was following me, shadowing me, and go up to this door and it says no soliciting on it. And I'm like, you know, one out of like 10 people with no soliciting get mad at you. They get mad at you and just apologize, say I'm sorry and leave, right? But I'm like, nine out of 10 times I never say anything. And uh, well, this guy heard everything I said. The window is wide open. He comes out just freaking out at me, yelling at me. And I'd set, because I just got to sell like the door before and I'd set water down on the side. And um, and he was yelling. I was like, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, we're leaving. We're walking off the door and I forgot the water. And so walking halfway down, I'm t- talking, to the, talking to the rep and I'm like, hey, like, yeah, that's one out of those ten. I guess. Like, <laughs> that's the one. That's the one. <laughs> so don't be afraid to not, you know, knock those. And 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 then the door opens and he, he says, "Hey." And I turn to him. I'm like, "Hey, he's coming back to probably apologize because he freaked out. We were really nice." Because I've had people come back and apologize. Yeah, they, they like realize yeah. they take a chill pill. Yeah, and uh, and so I'm thinking, oh, he's coming back to apologize. And I tell this to the ref as we're walking back, and then I see the guy bend down and pick up the water. And so as he starts walking, he's like, has it handed out to me like, you forgot this. Then about, we're about this far away, and he throws the water in my face. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 I mean, when he's yelling at me and everything, he's like, tell me how immature I was to knock his door and different stuff like that. So when he threw the water in my face, I sort of just smiled and started laughing. And I'm like, man, <laughs> it's really hot out here. Thanks for that. I have the same experience. Dude, I literally have the same story, but with a hose. And I, he they sprays me with off. the hose. And I was like, because th- he was so pissed. And he's like, huh? and he sprays me. I was like, thank you so much. I was like, if it's not too much to ask, can you just spray me one more time? It's like 100 degrees out here. And he sprayed me again, all frustrated, like he's like doing a, like a yeah. bad thing. Yeah. Like, Okay, one more time. That felt so good. <laughs> and then he calls the cops, and then the cop shows up to the next house as I'm selling him, and I end up selling his next door neighbor, and the cop helped me sell it because I had my license. <laughs> yeah, and my nice. house. <laughs> it was that's just like awesome. the coolest like secrets. Yeah. But no, that's like crazy. Like, and and one thing to point out for any rep that's listening to this, keep your cool. Yep, yep. Don't be a smart a. Don't be like you know saying anything stupid. Just yeah. be the humble. Like, just okay. be humble about it. You know, and cool. things turn out fun. Cool. I appreciate you guys jamming. Yeah, this yeah, is like way fun. fun. I, I I knew your names. I've never really got to like meet you guys. Mm-hmm. And anybody that's listening to this podcast should know like you guys are like some of the legends of like all all the space. Like yeah. this is an honor. So Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Yeah. Well, the problem you need to give us the hat back. I know. As you yeah. said, I was like yeah. anybody watching. I was like, we got, um, I, I, I'm rocking the app. So we. Uh, so do you have like you have a thing for hats then? Or I do. I do. Is it like you have to you have to wear one all the time? All the time. All the you're, time. You're in sales mode. Um, I'm a super have you ever have you ever sold that one? Nope. Yeah, I, I beg you if I don't. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's my, no, it's I, my weird superstition. Yeah, I, I'm in the same. I'm in the same boat. Like it's I, good I, you don't I, have any hair. Though. But I had hair at one point. <laughs> I had hair at one point. No, I, I, mean, I wear a hat because I sweat a lot, like like dripping on iPads, dripping on paperwork, like I People sweat. Like, what's he hiding? Yeah, what's he hiding? <laughs> Who's this snow? creeper? He sweats like associated with like nervousness, yeah. and, but I'm I'm totally calm. It could just be snowing outside, and I take the trash out and I walk back and I'm sweating. It's just the inherited genes from my ancestors that were farmers. My wife weirdly has that problem. Yeah, is she gonna lie to you? She won't listen. Yeah, <laughs> so so I mean, I, I I part of like. Part of something about me is I always want to like prove that you know that something's not keeping me back or holding me back, and so there was a day when I was knocking that I decided I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna sell without a hat today until I make a sale, and it went I went longer than I ever have without without making a sale, and I I almost went back to my car multiple times to get a hat, and, and I, I just you know kept my my determination I'm gonna make a sale I finally got one. And the guy was like, man, you sweaty. Are you okay? Do you need to come? Do you need some water? Like, because I was like <laughs> dripping. And as soon as I closed the deal, gave me his credit card, signed him up. I ran back to my car, hat back on. But like, I've never, I've only sold like half a day to make one sale without a hat on. But other than that, like I. It's weird, the little superstitions. Yeah. I had a rep, wore the same shirt every day mm-hmm. for the whole two years. It's Chris Malink, number one guy at Dish. 
Yeah. And then I had, I've, I've talked to, I had another rep that always had to wear a white shirt and had the top button buttoned. All the way up. All the way up. Mm-hmm. And he's like, dude, it's the new trick. They're, it gets him every time. Yeah. And I'm like, Superstitions are real. They are so yeah. real. Yeah, I get a call from Brigham Lindsay and he's like, I need my Chick Fil A. He's like, yeah, I hate Chick Fil A first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he this won't, was he won't this was a city unless there's a Chick Fil A in that city. It's wild. Yeah. Brigham's yeah. is Coke and his Chick Fil A. Yep. Well, and and he won't say this one. This is watch too. Oh, really? Because he was in the middle of a cell, literally he was selling the lady, and he went to point at something and realized he didn't have his watch on, and he stopped the cell right there. He's like, hey, I'll come back. Ran off the door, <laughs> called me, and told me, Chase, I'm driving back a half an hour to my apartment. I forgot my watch. Came back, got back there, so it took him an hour, half an hour in both ways. Oh took him an gosh. hour, got back, and ended up selling like 12 back then. But he, he had to have his watch on. Well, and he's like, he contributed to why he didn't have a cell that day. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, it's, all, it's all in the brain. But at the it's same crazy. time, like, it it, it, from, from a, a, an interesting perspective, like, standpoint, though, is, is if you, like, if it's your shirt or your hat, like, it's never, it's never your sales abilities. If you're not selling, it's like, like I, like, I have my shirt tucked in, and if I'm in a neighborhood and I have it, I'm not feeling like, like Yeah, it's in, not, it's not like, me, it's, it's not my me. shirt tucked oh, in. So I'm, maybe this is an untucked neighbor, I'll untuck my shirt. And then I'll sell, and I'll keep selling with my shirt untucked, like, days, weeks, months, until I'm, like, having an off day. And I'm like, maybe this is a tuck neighbor, and I'll tuck my shirt back in. Because it's not my sales, it's not my pitch, it's not my ability. Not the area. It's, it's, not, it's not the area, it's just, maybe it's just a tuck neighborhood. So I'll tuck my shirt back in, and within, like, ten minutes, I'm a sale. And so, like, it's the same, like, like I need my watch, or I need my Chick-fil-A, like, it's, it's those, like, kind of, like, it's not me, it's, it's, I didn't do this routine, so that way it's never, like, well, it's you like, never doubt your ability. Like, it's a golfers, oh, of course. basketball players, yeah. Uh, yeah. a lot of people, their shoes, their, their, their ball, their routine is crucial. So important, yeah. Okay, this has been fun. Yeah. I love yeah. that we just yeah. jammed out some yeah. 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 Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Uh, even now, like, Look how sweaty I am. <laughs> like, look.